Hello, welcome to Halcyon War. On this episode, I'm going to be looking at a game I have a tremendous amount of affection for, and even made my top five games list that I produced earlier on in the year. Fable was one of the most highly anticipated games upon its announcement, with the creator, Peter Molyneux, spinning a narrative that it was going to be the single greatest game of all time. Released in September of 2004, upon its release, it left most gamers scratching their heads wondering where the game that he promised would be released. After a time, you'll actually look more evil, you, you know, you will look more sinister, your jaw offsets, your eyes get a little bit more narrow, you'll walk into towns and all the women will go inside and lock all their doors because they'll be scared of you and see them looking through the window. <laughs> <laughs> and this wouldn't even be the last time that Peter Molyneux proclaimed that his next game was going to be the equivalent of a gaming messiah when he pitched his next project to people. Originally developed under the name Project Ego, the game promised a unique experience in allowing players choice in morality, playstyle, progression of the campaign with side quests, and also a wealth of interaction with the world, with every NPC able to interact with the player in a variety of ways. And with the appeal of multi-layered combat, the game offered gamers the opportunity to be able to diversify their gameplay in ways that other RPGs simply couldn't or refused to elect you to. And had a beautiful world crafted in a cartoony style and a soundtrack that meant that you stay on the menus a little bit longer than perhaps you should. And when you add all this together, it had the potential to be a truly fantastic game. And with the DLC of The Lost Chapters being released later on in 2005, the game had an all inclusive version called the Fable Anniversary Edition that I decided to purchase and buy for no other reason than I wanted to see how much the developers had developed the game onwards in terms of its gameplay and obviously more important to them, its graphics. But I suppose the biggest question is, did it deliver on its original promises and does the game still stack up today compared to its more modern day counterparts, especially considering the release of Mass Effect Andromeda is right around the corner. And so to find out, I dusted off my original Xbox, pulled out the Mammoth controller, had a work through on the original version that I kept, but I also bought the Anniversary Edition and played through that to compare and contrast the two in real time. And this is especially pertinent considering that re-releases and remasters are going to become a more prominent feature of the gaming industry in years to come with games like Final Fantasy VII having massive hype considering that, again, on the face of it, it's simply a remastered version teasing additional features, but no one really knows for sure. But, nevertheless, let's take a look at a game that I have just boundless respect and had a ton of fun replaying. The Fable Anniversary Edition. So let's kick off with perhaps maybe not the most important aspect to this game, but certainly the thing that's going to grab you first, the setting and presentation of Fable. Fable is a game that's set in a fictional world of Albion, um, a magical place which takes inspiration from the Middle Ages of England and transpires prior to the events of the Industrial Era, where everything's still kind of magically and fairy tale -y. It's a place where mythical beasts, magics and legends are rife and that the inhabitants of this world simply take as fact that people will traverse the world and just naturally come across magical behemoths and monsters that will likely put them in situations of peril in need of people to come and rescue them, thereby creating or facilitating the need for something called the Heroes Guild, which plays a very prominent role in this world. The world shares a lot in common with the lore of other well-loved magical franchises such as Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter and World of Warcraft, so fans of those franchises will feel right at home in this world. The premise of the game is set around the journey and the fate of the protagonist of the game, a young boy later known as the Hero of Oakvale, or Hero for short. The game does a good job of presenting the world and its lore to you in miniaturised story sections, told using narration and panels, stylised in the game's art style, and helps give the feel of an epic story unfolding before you. So as the hero, you must traverse the world as, well, a hero, battling various villains, monsters, taking on quests and saving people, or slaughtering them depending on your point of view. And you'll be taking on enemies of different frequency, of different difficulty, of different abilities and power levels. And you'll be using a bunch of these abilities to unravel puzzles and uncover legends set forth to you by the Hero Skill, the de facto base of operations for your character and a central pillar of the community in the world of Albion. While the ambition was admirable and the intention was clearly to create something unique, the premise 
ends up being a classic tale of revenge and the world feels familiar if you've played other games of this genre with a slight caveat that the stylized look of the game coupled with its beautifully composed music does give a unique sensation while playing. This is not to take away from the end product, however, the overselling from the get-go left a lot of customers disappointed upon release. For me though, the game is removed enough from the other games so that I can still have a great experience when playing it. And it can't be denied that whenever you boot up this game, even if you've never played this game before, it's weird, you have a sense of nostalgia in the way that it's styled and the way that it's presented to you with the, book, the storybook opening up, the character being presented to you in a very basic, yet yeah, touching way, and gives the player enough of what they recognise with enough new to make the experience feel unique in its own way. And so with the setting and premise out of the way, let's take a look at the most prominent ver the thing of this game that I think makes it stand out from other games of its same genre and enables it to keep up with its competition in the modern age. The gameplay. Well, the gameplay is centered around the standard core elements of any good RPG game. Combat, character progression, exploration, quest completion, customization, and loot collection. Sweet loot collection. And in this game, above all other games, the loot is plentiful and it's staggered throughout the course of the game. So it always gives you a carrot to come back to other le levels and play uh, again to try and get those bits and pieces throughout the course of your playthrough. The combat is one of the most varied yet simple real-time systems I've played, and even today I've yet to come across another that allows the kind of freedom afforded here, with perhaps Jedi Academy being the exception to that. However, I have to move on to my first gripe with this game. The anniversary edition of the game has the combat map to each of the pad buttons giving one use of one of three attack types. So instead of the original version where you had to set yourself into an attack type, so ranged, magic, uh, or hand-to-hand -hand combat, they're all readily available at the touch of a button, which sounds great. However, it just it makes the gameplay feel slightly more basic than it did originally. And I know it's hearkening to the second and third games, but to be perfectly honest, the mechanics in the first game were superior. Um, but that aside, you've got uh, melee attacks, which give you the option to flourish as they did in the original game, albeit again, they're less useful because the combat has been updated to make sure that you can't just spam that to win. Um, so you can use that to break through your opponent's stats. Magic can be used in a variety of ways to directly attack enemies and cause effects that are advantageous to the player, such as lightning strikes, uh, effect casts, you can summon things, and you can also enhance your character with various things such as the rage hulking ability, which is pretty sweet. Or, and this is the thing that I utilize to the very least in the game because it's kind of rendered useless by the magic, are your range attacks. So you can use bows and crossbows to damage your enemies from afar. The reason for this is because they don't deal a commensurate amount of damage to be able to be worth it or, or to focus on your abilities in that sense. I mean, just personally, my game strategy was always one of attack hand-to-hand uh, -hand and emphasize the magical abilities that would allow you to, to do that more efficiently because it just deals way more damage than you'd expect from any other attack type. The way the system is structured, you can roll, block, dodge, counter, and attack in a wide variety of ways that grant the player a great deal of freedom when dealing with groups of enemies, singular enemies that require different strategies to fell, or simply more powerful bosses that require stronger attacks to defeat. The strategy I tend to employ focuses on a combination of magical abilities such as the Berserker mode, Time Slow, and Assassin's Rush to outflank, outmaneuver, and overpower enemies. This allows for maximum attack damage while also allowing freedom to take on enemies at your own pace and taking out less powerful foes initially before tackling the bosses. However, you can tailor the combat to suit your needs and the game does a great job of allowing you freedom to do this, while also offering a great selection of weaponry to choose from while you progress through the game. And I'd say that the prevailing feeling in the game is that while the combat is well-rounded and deep, it never, and it makes you feel powerful, there's no doubt about that, but the game never makes you feel godlike, like the combat's going to be easy. Um, even in the later levels when you think that you're going to have the, the, the enemies pegged due to a lack of difficulty setting and having been able to smash, you know, more numerous enemies, the bosses will still present a challenge and they'll smash through your defences and render you helpless if you're not careful. And that way I feel that there's always an element of skill involved in the combat of the game. You can never afford to become complacent for too long, especially against the bosses. 
character progression is solid, with the Heroes Guild serving as your experience hub, where, after accumulating experience orbs from quests and from killing enemies, you can spend them to level up your character however you wish. You can focus on a specific ability, aspects of your physicality, magical abilities, and stealth and agility. These will outwardly affect how your character performs in combat and also their outward physical appearance, with more physical characters looking larger and stockier, magical oriented players developing blue mana patterns all over their body, and players focused on guile and agility leaner in appearance. Exploration in the world is easy, with branching paths leading to different areas and the ability to teleport between areas you've already visited using your guild seal. And I'd say that while the exploration feels fine, with the exception of the silver keys, which is a very, very limp-wristed excuse to have to go back to an area, there's no real sense of open-worldness beyond exploring an area for the first time. Once you've explored the area, you very rarely come back to it. You have markets and traders that are set up there, for instance, but they don't have any unique items or anything that's conducive to making them integral to going back. Um, and as a result, the game feels fairly linear. But then again, a lot of people do find RPGs overwhelming at times. I know people have put off playing Skyrim, uh, Fallout for the longest time because they know how much investment is involved from the, uh, is, is required of the player. Whereas RPGs like this give you a taste of the progression and the storytelling elements without overwhelming you with a ton of side quests to do in an entire world that's literally packed full of content to explore. It has the feel of a linear game which point to point, objective to objective, you can do. But it has the benefit of, of you being able to explore everywhere whenever you want. So it enables players to feel more like they're taking it at their own speed, which I can appreciate is important to some players. And I'd add that the game itself is well designed. Um, there's plenty to do. The world itself is as linear as it is, packed with plenty of chests, plenty of enemies, plenty of objectives. Enough side quests to keep you busy through your, I'd say, 10 to 15 hour uh, play through 20 to 25 if you want to max your character up without using my hob cave cheat. And with the enemies regenerating wherever you go, there's plenty of opportunity to grind for XP if you ever hit a part of a story that you just simply can't progress through. This does lead into a potentially game-breaking mechanic where enemies will respawn when leaving an area and returning. It has become a tradition of mine to head into the hob caves as soon as possible to hone my skills and obtain a ton of XP before actually progressing in the game, which can give you an immense advantage if you're prepared to grind for the XP when cam completing the campaign. Like Goku arriving on Namek and decimating the Ginyu Force, you can become a nigh unstoppable powerhouse if you're prepared to abuse this aspect of the game. And there are other times when this mechanic can be abused, such as prior to complete competing in the arena or the climax of the original game, but prior to the lost chapters. Quest completion is your bread and butter in this game, with quests available from the guild in this world. Upon completion, you will be rewarded with gold, XP, special items, trophies, or a combination of all. The only particularly challenging quest I found, if you have decided to progress through the game naturally, would be the arena itself, or perhaps the confrontation at Hook Coast both of which will test your abilities and will punish you if you have not come prepared with as many health and mana potions as you can afford. The customization in this game was impressive for its time, with each costume having four separate parts in various colour palettes to allow you to pick and choose if you wish. However, this cult coupled with the ability to customise your character's hairstyles, tattoo designs, along with the armour and weapons carried, not to mention your moral demeanour and leveled abilities, meant that the character could be crafted in a way that was tactful and unique to you. Well, nowhere near the levels of Elder Scrolls or even Knights of the Old Republic, it was sufficient to allow you a sense of real input in how your character looked and behaved. While these decisions will invariably affect the NPC's attitude and interactions towards you, ranging from adoration, indifference to genuine fear. And as I mentioned at the beginning, don't worry if your main thing in games is to get the loot and get the most powerful weapons, because trust me, this game's progression in terms of when it lets you have the loot is really well placed. In terms of loot, there are weapons here that would make the devil himself cower. So if you're the kind of person that just grinds and grinds and grinds for the most powerful weapons to be able to just walk through the game blissfully unaware of the dangers that before you, then this game has got you covered. Gold, better weapons and gear, legendary items, power-ups, and books that add an extra layer to the lore of the world all serve to keep you progressing, with some only obtaining in unique ways. The Harbinger is only available to those with the physical ability to pull the sword from the stone, and the Solar's Great Sword is over 70,000 gold, which is difficult to amass even with pro proper investment in properties and rent, and a myriad of other items and weapons that are hidden inside the locked chest, which are only unlocked with the silver keys. These silver keys are located throughout the world, and while 
difficult to find, the rewards are more than worth the effort. Add to this the NPC interactions which give you the option to intimidate them, to ask them to follow you on your adventures, or even pursue romantic relationships and eventually do the hibbity jibbity with them. The mechanics of the AI of the world may be dated, but the depth for the time was certainly very impressive and made it feel more alive than other sandbox games 10 years down the line. And so all in all, I'd have to say oh, the, the gameplay mechanics are some of the best and most well-rounded and polished and conducive to the game theme as I've ever seen. It's the reason why I've completed this game 100% completion four separate times over the course of the original game and the anniversary edition. And yes, while the game may fall just short of its lofty aspirations given what Pe Peter Molyneux originally promised, I'd say that the game is still great and lovingly crafted. It's a well-tempered and balanced experience with plenty of depth and a great deal of thought put into the satisfaction of the player and how that satisfaction is obtained and does really well to stand the test of time and it's still immense fun even 12, 13 years on. And so very quickly I'm going to look at an aspect of the game that you've, again, I've touched on in some of the other points but I just want to give a bit more uh, emphasis to which is the presentation that Fable has to offer. And as asinine to point out is, the first thing you notice about Fable is that it looks like, well, a Fable. Everything in the world has a cartoony, stylized feel, with examples of this being things like the hero character's heads being slightly undersized with their eyes over wide to give the impression of being slightly childlike, with the boss characters having slightly larger heads and more prominent eyes to give a more uh, scary and direct look to them, and you've got things like the guards having their eyes obscured, giving the uh, giving the illusion at least of authority and uh, a lack of consideration to the player being able to engage with them on a human level. And yes, it is fair to say that some of the animations are probably the wrong side of really badly rigid and unresponsive. In fact, they bear some start some startling resemblances to other animated cartoon characters. No, you see. No matter which way you go, I block you. However, the whole game has been crafted to give the feel of a world that's ancient and that is being retold to you as you play, which is very clever considering that it brings back elements of storybook telling from your childhood, which again, it just evokes a feeling of nostalgia even if you've never played the game or seen the story before. The game attempts to allow the player to wander and take in the world at their own pace and this is a deliberate choice that allows the players to enjoy the environments and the music that accompanies each area despite their inherent technical limitations. As mentioned before, the music in the game is beautifully composed and is well timed to coincide with different towns, missions and cues for the story to invoke feelings of wonder, feelings of happiness and feelings of anxiety or dread. And the soundtrack itself is properly amazing but then it would be as it's been composed by Danny Elf. You know, the guy who composed the Simpsons theme tune and the theme tune to the 1989 Batman film. Yep, that one. And Fable 2 is predictably epic at times, somber in others, and has an air of unease that can be downright charming and heartwarming too. The game has a great sense of humour with intentionally childlike or immature aspects such as clearly adult jokes set in a childlike theme within the story, or even something as base as a chicken kicking contest, or the ability to be able to fire on command. The graphics, while overhauled on the Anniversary Edition, have not held up as well as its gameplay. It still has a charm in its aesthetic that invokes the same emotions today as it did upon its release based on its sound concept and execution, with, of course, a few minor glitches which have been overhauled for this release, and I can report in my playthrough I encountered no major glitches or game crashes at all. Overall, I'd say the game has a good feel. Albeit, it can't even hope to compete with the Mac Daddies of the genre such as Skyrim or Dark Souls. That's absolutely certain and no one's calling that to question. But you would have to argue that Skyrim and Dark Souls have a very similar set in terms of the stylistic approach to them with Dark Souls taking a slightly more gritty and darker look, sure. Skyrim taking a more Norse-inspired look. But both are effectively the same thing, whereas Fable does its best to try and set itself apart from that crowd. And I just feel it has a unique sense of presentation that just sets it apart in my collection and means that anything that precedes it or comes after just has that to compete with in a way that they can't directly because it's subjective. If you like the look of the story or you don't. I, for one, enjoyed it. And I'd say the same about Skyrim and Dark Souls, but to, for differing reasons.
And so we come to the final point to what's worth touching on at least, the story. And this is where the game, I feel, shows its ultimate weaknesses and its lack of real ambition. I won't give away too much, but you start as an innocent boy whose family is murdered and for his safety is taken to live and train at the Heroes Guild, the learning place of the heroes and the base of their operations. From here, the boy graduates and is set on a path of becoming a paragon of good or an agent of evil. And along the way, he discovers mysteries, plots and a dark tale that sheds light on the events of his childhood tragedy and further still secrets that have laid dormant for millennia. But as epic as that sounds, it's told in a very slow way and the twists are telegraphed from a mile away, meaning it's tough to get too invested in the story given it just lacks any kind of emotional impact, despite the setting and presentation. And add into that, that more often than not, you sit there oftentimes guessing, I bet this is gonna happen. And then it does, it just kind of takes you out of the experience more than it should do. It's a tried, tested and basic story that lacks anything real in terms of twists and turns with maybe two plot points that kind of just serve to pad out the game another couple of hours because they amount to the same thing. And again, I feel the story's let down by the fact that it's it's told in these panel cutscenes and these edited cutscenes that just kind of contrast in tone sometimes and they don't serve to give a really clear narrative to the player. While the stylized panels help to make the story feel epic, the cutscenes somehow lower the stakes. It's difficult to put my finger on, but if the panels had been the only way of conveying the story, then the whole feel of the game would have been slightly more thematic, whereas going from the panels to poorly animated NPCs talking to our virtually silent protagonist has the feel of something of an anti-climax. The Lost Chapters go some way of balancing what feels like a game that is geared towards more evil players, the rewards being much richer for evil players in the original version and adds an extra hour or two to the overall gameplay time. However, I'd argue that the story is not what's going to urge you to play it through again, and it's easily the weakest aspect of the game, and something that, with the hype and the expectation that was peddled originally, really should have been taken more into consideration when giving a unique experience, or a slightly unique narrative. Nevertheless, it's serviceable, and it'll keep you gauged just enough throughout the playthrough. And so, did Fable deliver? Well, I'd argue it did. I mean, it cracked my top five games list, and if that doesn't tell you enough, nothing will. But why is this, considering that the consensus of most fans of the series is one of apathy and mild annoyance at the outcome of the first, second, and third games? Well, simple. For me, I wasn't aboard the hype train when it came out in 2004. I actually picked up the game about four years later in 2008 and played it through on my original Xbox when I was just looking for a new experience. I just see the game on merits based on my personal appearance, and the truth is that the game has a great deal of care, attention to detail, excellent in its execution in certain aspects that matter, and a great deal of innocence to the game when, in the same conversation, you can kick a decapitated enemy's head across a battlefield. So, it's an odd world with its own quirks and its own little twists and turns in what you can do, but it just felt different to anything I was playing at the time and gave me the kicks that I was looking for in terms of a gameplay power trip experience, shall we say. And it's not like I don't sympathise with the people that were on board the train. I mean, I, for instance, was burned badly with Mass Effect 3 when it was built up to nigh impossible proportions. And I completely understand the attitude. The practice serves to warn of the dangers of overhyping a game when it's, it's a good game. It's, it's not a bad game, it's just it's been hyped to be much better than it is. So when it's finally delivered and it under delivers on what it promises, it's somehow then rated lower than what it should be, considering that that's a problem with the developers and the production department and marketing and things of that nature. They really should address that practice more thoroughly if they want to stop this negative perception of games being released and not delivering on what they realistically can produce to players. But the fact of the matter is, the game delivers on what I think it needed to. Your character be can be as dark or as light as you want him to be. The action can be it can be action-packed and gritty, or you can be slick and untouchable. And the game can be as easy or as hard as you want it to be, with no difficulty setting, and the only difficulty that's imposed upon you is how quickly you want to progress the story without taking on the side quests or grinding for more experience. And the gamer's willingness to prepare for the challenges ahead rather than just dealing with them as and when they're presented to the player. And, best of all, you can have the adventure at your own pace, or just go along with the story. The choice is yours, and neither one is, is adversely going to affect your experience. And, quite frankly, the game will always be one of my favourites, because it does what RPGs should do, despite what it set out to achieve, and despite what the developers promised originally. So, I'll leave on this slight caveat. This game is not for people that are looking for a jaw-dropping 
tale told in the Middle Ages when magic and beasts and mythical creatures were rife. This just isn't the kind of game that's going to give you that kind of narrative that's going to keep you gripped from start to finish. But if you're after a great RPG with fantastic combat, plenty of humour, plenty to do and see, tons of loot to obtain, and a beautifully crafted world with a music score so beautiful you'll feel like an eight-year-old again listening to a bedtime story. If you have time to sit and check it out, this game is one you will not regret playing through. And if I'm going to rate it... I suppose it came on my top, so it's got to get a nine. It's not a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination, but just for an outright experience, this game is really one of the best I've ever played. So yeah, let's call it a nine out of 10 and say, that was this episode of Halcyon. Thank you very much for watching this episode. Please like, share, and subscribe. Um, as you probably noticed, I'm supporting a lot of other channels these days. I'm trying to get involved in collaborations and indeed reaching out to developers and things of that nature to try and get bigger and better things rolling. The subscription ship is going up, which is great, but I'd still really appreciate you guys having a watch and uh, a like and a share of some of the other uh, um, content creators that I'm sponsoring at the moment or that I'm advocating for. Uh, please go back through my library. I've been producing a fair bit of content recently, which I hope is you know maintaining or improving the levels that are expected so please uh, let me know what your feedback is on, on those uh, in the meantime again i'm going to rephrase this please dislike or don't share or don't subscribe but i'd like you to do the opposite if that's at all possible so if you could like share and subscribe that'd be really really cool so thank you very much for watching again please stay tuned for the next episode of whatever the hell i decide to make next take care and i'll see you guys on the next episode